Space is huge. One light year is about 5 trillion miles, and the universe is 93 billion light years in diameter. That's 465 quadrillion miles. Even within our own solar system, the distance between us and our nearest neighbors is insane. If we imagine the Earth as the size of a soccer ball, the distance between it and the Mars ball would be enough to fit 170 million soccer fields in between. And from the Earth to the Moon, it would be more than 3 million soccer fields. Even closer objects that we've sent into near-Earth orbit, like the International Space Station, are 250 miles from the surface of the Earth. That's the distance between New York City and DC. With astronauts being that far away from Earth, you might be asking, how is it possible that they have internet access up there? Especially since there's still billions of people back on Earth that don't. The story of how we got internet into space is fascinating, but it's actually only the beginning of the ultimate goal that groups like NASA are working towards, which is to set up a permanent internet presence on the moon and then on Mars, setting the stage for humans to finally become a multi-planetary species. When that happens, it's going to change everything. When astronauts stand on the surface of the moon, they will be part of what President Kennedy called the most hazardous and dangerous and greatest adventure on which man has ever embarked. We all know that our exploration of space started in the Cold War, but what a lot of people don't grasp is just how fast this development was. In little over a decade, we went from the first satellite in space, to the first animals in space, then to the first man in space, and finally to the first people walking on another celestial body. That's so much faster than most of our scientific achievements. For reference, it took us 200 years of experimenting to get the first light bulb. But at the same time that the American and Soviet governments were investing billions into space travel, we were developing technology that would later on become what we know today as the internet. And actually, if it wasn't for our need to communicate with faraway objects like the satellites, we wouldn't have even gotten the internet. Early research by the US Department of Defense gave us the Telstar 1 communication system, which led to the ARPANET computer network, which over time evolved into the internet. That's that right. little mark with the A and then the ring around it. At. See, that's what I said. Mm -hmm. um, Katie said she thought it was about. Yeah. Oh. But I'd never heard or it. Around. I'd never heard it about. said. About. I'd always that's seen around. the mark, but never yeah. heard it said. And then yeah. it sounded. While internet access exploded across the planet in the 90s and early 2000s, astronauts on the International Space Station, or ISS, were a bit late to the game. The ISS crew only got hooked up to the internet on January 22nd, 2010. And what's the first thing they did with internet access? They tweeted. Yeah, I know, not really that impressive. But this tweet actually is impressive. It's one of the most groundbreaking events in human history. Because this tweet sent to Earth by NASA flight director TJ Creamer became the first intelligent extraterrestrial message ever received by humans. Yes, it was sent by humans, but still, the tweet is alien. And it's with this tweet that humans officially crossed into an entirely different category as a species. A little more on that in a second. Let's first find out how this tweet was even sent. NASA uses a fleet of low Earth orbit satellites that all work together to form the Tracking and Data Relay Satellite System, or TDRSS. These satellites receive data requests from onboard the ISS and send the signal down to a receiver on the ground below on Earth, which then processes the request before returning the response back along the same path. You can imagine this would take a while, and in the beginning, space internet was incredibly slow. But since 2019, NASA has upgraded their system so quickly that, by now, the ISS crew enjoys internet speeds of 600 megabits per second. That's 10 times faster than the global average we have on Earth. Which honestly, I don't think is fair, because there's some spots in my house where the Wi-Fi just gives out, and I have to either reboot the system or take my stuff somewhere else. Like, it's very annoying. And soon, space internet is going to get even faster. NASA's new Aluma-T system shoots data from the ISS to Earth using high-speed lasers. That would boost internet speeds up to 1.2 gigabytes per second. Which is really impressive, but faster internet on the ISS is not the game-changing technology that we should care about. What is really game-changing is setting up a permanent internet presence on the moon. 
NASA is now partnering up with Nokia's Bell Labs to build a 4K network tower, which would be carried to the moon in a couple years. This tower would be set up so that future astronauts would have constant internet access on the moon. And it's not just NASA. SpaceX announced that a rocket due to launch at some point this year would also be carrying a simple 4G network to the moon. And when that happens, we're going to officially have a lunar internet. Lunar net? Is that a word? If it's not, I'm claiming it. And once this lunar net is set up, the next step would be to set up a similar structure on Mars. And that's what this video is about. As soon as we set up that first network on the surface of Mars, everything's gonna change. Because then that would mean that humans would have a permanent physical presence on another planet. Which would mean that humans would officially become a multi-planetary species. Why we should care is because that's gonna have profound impact for human society. Both back on Earth, but also for this new Martian society that we're gonna be building. And it's all possible because of the internet. Some futurists have already zoomed out and imagined what the future is gonna look like in this scenario. And their predictions are about life in the new world, but also what it means for the old world. As Earth settlers stay longer on Mars, gradually they could develop a new Martian identity, a blend of various Earth cultures and new traditions and norms unique to life on Mars. And over time, kind of like the early American settlers, they could end up declaring their independence from Earth. So would that mean that these Martians would no longer be considered Earthlings? So it's possible that while we wait to find actual aliens, we could become the aliens. But if we do keep a very close connection between Earthlings and the Martians, some futurists suggest that these Martians could help us solve problems back on Earth. They could maybe provide all of our energy needs from mining the moon or nearby asteroids stopping the climate damage we've done on Earth. And as we get even more connected with faster internet and VR technology, humans on Earth could end up living remotely on Mars, and the same with the Martians. In this scenario, the border between the two planets wouldn't be there. Earth and Mars would become a blended culture. It's insane to think that not even 70 years ago, humans couldn't even send a rocket into space, but now we're having legitimate conversations about us being a multi-planetary species. It's almost like we've entered into a new stage of evolution, of life beyond Earth. And it's all going to be possible because of that first step of getting internet on the moon, pretty soon. Thanks for watching. If you're also fascinated by digital technology and why we should care, consider subscribing. It's a great way to help grow this channel to reach millions of people who love technology but want to examine its social implications too. If you have any comments, leave them down below. I'll see you in the next one.